Hey, happy Friday. Today we're talking about some new, fresh, hot off the press propaganda from CNN and other news outlets talking about cannabis and risk factors for heart disease. Today's guest is Dr. Benjamin Kaplan. He is a medical doctor. Dr. Kaplan and I met about a year ago when we were ironically on a media story together about Hopley and Viroid in the cannabis industry. Anyway, these egregious news stories that we're talking about today are all about two abstracts, meaning brief summaries of the research, that that were recently published online, but the full research article has not been published or presented yet. I'll be attaching the abstracts to the show notes of this episode if you want to give them a read. So although I'd love to dissect every component of these papers, they do not exist yet. Really, this conversation is focused on talking with Dr. Kaplan about what he has observed in his practice on the subject and some clear issues with media competency and fear-mongering. We are all biased, but we will never be as biased as CNN. Thank you to the patrons of this podcast. It would not be possible without you. And thank you to Jesse and Jen for asking some great questions this week. I hope myself and Dr. Kaplan can help answer them for you. If you are not a patron of this podcast, you can still help me out immensely by leaving a five-star review on whatever platform you listen to podcasts. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It's it's a pleasure to have you on, and I think it's so cool. Um, before I fully introduce you, I think it's really cool. I was trying to make content about these new studies because obviously there's some like fear mongering content that's out right now in all these different media companies. So I was like, okay, I'm going to make some content about this because I don't believe this is capturing the correct picture for our community. Right. And then I sent you a DM and I'm like, hey, Dr. Kaplan, like, do you have any, uh, do you have anything to say about this? And you're like, oh yeah, I have a lot to say about it. <laughs> and now uh, one day later we are recording a podcast. So I really appreciate your flexibility and willingness to come on. And if you wouldn't mind just giving a little more background about what you do, about your new book, about, you know, being an MD in the space, and then we'll start talking about cannabis in cardiovascular health. Sounds great. Um, thanks, Riley. Um, yeah, no, it's a privilege to be on. I think, you know, I'm one of these lucky people who's found his career um, and, and real passion, um, which is educating the public about cannabis. Um, you know, we all grew up in this crazy, ignorant society. Um, and I, I sort of stood in my primary care office. I'm a general doctor, a general practitioner. Um, realizing that nobody really got it, that, you know, the, the doctors around me, the industry of cannabis, even like the general public, like they know that it's safe and they've all heard people doing well with it, but they don't seem to know very much at all. Um, and nor did I at the time. So I've dedicated my career to learning about cannabis and I'm, I'm trying to share it with the public along the way. Um, I do that in every way I think people might want to learn. You know, I have my own podcast. I have a, a YouTube channel. I do socials. I also have blogs. And, and actually, you know, what you said, I just finished writing a book, um, the doctor approved cannabis handbook, um, which is out on Amazon and everywhere books are sold. We will link that in the show notes too. If anybody wants to purchase that book, you absolutely should. Sorry, keep going. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think if, if, if there were a single book that you could point to that highlighted all the benefits, um, I'm, I'm not sure there's another one. Um, you know, the Doctor Proved Cannabis Handbook is a guide that explains how medical cannabis can be used with different health problems. It gives you the facts and steps to use it safely and legally for better health. Um, you know, there there is not a point or a claim made in the book which doesn't have also a peer-reviewed reference right in the back. So it's, it's meant for everybody to read and understand. Simple language, no jargon but it's also available to stand up to scrutiny and scientific inquiry and doctors out there who are also curious. Um, That's awesome. I need. I just purchased my uh, my copy, but I want you to sign it next time I see you in person. I think that would be of cool. Of course, <laughs> of course. No, I'd be honored. And, and there's so much in there. I mean, there's, there's a chapter on mental health stuff. There's a chapter on sleep stuff. There's a chapter on anti-inflammation. All the stuff we're talking about here today about cardiac health is referred to in part and section in the book. You know, this this cannabis thing is not just a medicine. It's not like 
Advil or Percocet uh, or, or Benadryl. It's a whole system actor. Um, and that's you know what we're going to talk about a little bit more today. The idea of pigeonholing cannabis as, oh, it has this effect on your heart is such a silly thing to say because it's acting like exercise would. It's acting like sleep would. You know, those things affect all of your body parts, not just, you know, just your heart. Yeah. And I mean, can we just start with like an overview of cannabis and cardiovascular health? And then we'll like really get into these studies. But, um, you know, obviously we have I shouldn't say obviously this is not obvious at all. We have, um, you know, CB1 receptors on our heart tissues. And we know from previous research that cannabis can act or I should say THC. I'm not going to say cannabis in general because I'm not sure about um, hemp flour or hemp products. But THC can act as a, it can help, well, it will drop your blood pressure if you're a new user of cannabis, but I find it really interesting. It can actually raise your blood pressure if you're a seasoned chronic user of cannabis. I found that to be one of the more interesting things. Is it the... It's the opposite, actually. Um, Is it the opposite? So this is exactly, this is exactly the kind of discussion that we need to have and that the listeners and viewers should understand um, science is an adventure. It's not a. It's not like archaeology, where you kind of dig up bones and you understand. Oh, this is a dinosaur. It's a discovery yeah. process where we're learning. Um, so exactly like you said, you can identify studies that show cannabis's effect on blood pressure in the short term is different than the long term. Um, and is there that are some studies term? that show. Oh, sorry, sorry. Please finish. Keep going. <laughs> no, no. I, I was just going to say, you know, there are some studies that show in the short term it's raising blood pressure. Some studies that show in the short term it's lowering blood pressure and vice versa for long term. Um, okay, so depending okay. on how how disciplined you are as a reader, you can stop reading when you hear one story or you can read many different stories and get a completely confusing picture. Well, and this is kind of the trouble in research in general, too, because you can find almost anything to cite. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the thing that was cited the most or done by the most reputable you know, research institute. You can write a paper and find almost anything in the archives of science to cite and back up your claim. So, you know, I'm, I'm really exactly glad we right. are talking about this. And I've talked about this on social media in the past, but some new users of cannabis or some people who might be combining cannabis with something like alcohol when they uh, smoke or vape or something and that effect hits them really fast. Um, I've seen people pass out from cannabis and I always attributed that to the drop in, in blood pressure. But maybe I'm not correct about this. So I would love to get educated <laughs> by you. So, so yeah, no, no. I mean, in that case, passing out you know, you have to define what that means. Were they were they sort of so overwhelmed in shock? Um, was the experience so uh, powerful that that they had a quick drop in blood pressure? Um, and that can happen actually, even not because of the chemistry of cannabis, but because of what's happening in your fear. You know, when someone passes out, um, what that means is your your brain isn't getting the blood it wants, and so you pass out, and presumably you fall and you become level. So all of a sudden, the blood flows easily, more easily to your brain. Um, so it depends on what's happening. It can be low blood pressure caused by chemistry in cannabis. There, there, there is stuff in cannabis which can lower your blood pressure, just as you've suggested. Um, but it can also be, oh my God, I don't like this feeling. I'm terrified that I'm going to die. And that fear, which is not related necessarily to the, to, the, to the blood vessel effects of cannabis, but more the cognitive ones, that can make you pass out. That's such a good point. I haven't thought of it like that, but it does make sense that overwhelming feeling, that anxiety, that uncomfortableness that could definitely Mm -hmm. attribute to that. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, please continue the conversation on blood pressure or nitric oxide. I saw your awesome blog post. Thank you for sending Mm -hmm. that. I'm also going to put that in the show notes um, about nitric oxide and cardiovascular health. But I just also want to preface this with if there is any truth and validity to these studies, we do need to talk about this as a community because it is important to understand cardiovascular health to to understand any potential adverse effects i don't think these studies are you know done well and like really corroborate that in a good way but as consumers we we should be paying attention to this type of research just in case there are implications for us in our health there there is not likely going to be some flashy new reporter who uncovers a 
a dramatic, completely opposite from everything we've ever heard reality. Um, you know, we, we are pretty smart as an animal species, and we know that um, that someone playing around with a knife might hurt themselves. That's pretty yeah. intuitive. Um, but we also know that kids who grow up in countries that have lots of lots of cannabis don't seem all that different because we've never heard about that cannabis kid. Um, yeah. And we haven't heard about those cannabis heart attacks. Um, and, and that cultural sort of oral history is, is really important. Um, we do lived know- Lived experience. It's people's experiences lived, yeah. using the plant, yeah. Right. Um, we, we do know um, things like, you know, we have expressions like think with your gut. And we knew that long before we understood, oh, wow, your, your, your gut has a nervous system which has, say, 80% of the serotonin in your body. Yeah. Um, and we knew that in the 60s and 70s, cannabis was mind expanding, you know, like, like hori expand your horizons or whatever the hippies used to say. Oh, and it turns out, yeah, cannabis does expand your neural plasticity and it does expand the way that you think. There's, there's cultural knowledge, which isn't necessarily what we call crystallized knowledge, book knowledge. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, according to all of medical history and, 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 and normal history, um, we don't have something that kills people in cannabis. And, and, and cannabis has been with the human culture for as long as we have recorded history, 12,000 plus years. Yeah. And we don't have any sense that this is causing young people to die of heart attacks or old people to die of strokes um you know could those things happen of course you know yeah. cannabis is like the pharmacy behind the counter if you jump behind the counter and grab a random pill it might cause some damage so it depends on who you are it depends on what the pill is you gotta be specific with these things i am so glad you brought that up too because oh also i was kind of more saying like as new research comes out like we should pay attention to it not necessarily about this subject but uh, i'm totally, glad you brought totally, up yeah. a, about other pills and stuff too because i feel like everyone expects to be can for cannabis to be like as safe as water whereas every other pharmaceutical that's on the shelf even supplements that are available on the shelf everything has some sort of risk factor associated when you have bioactive compounds in your body like of course there's there's some sort of risk factor but we also know that cannabis is one of the safest natural medicines and it's very commonly used and we don't see a lot of adverse effects and like that should be a headline in itself not this fear-mongering stuff that we see from all these major news outlets Right, right. It's funny. Whenever any salacious news report comes um, in, into the mainstream, and you know the CNN news article is certainly um, salacious, um, I look up Reddit and I see kind of what the what the Reddit community says about things. And and of course, there's an appropriate, healthy, you know, kind of bilateral discussion. Some people saying, "Oh, it's great." Some people saying, "Oh, it's horrible." And there's everything in between. Um, one. One thing I really took away was was an interesting post saying, fun fact, living increases the risk of heart attack and stroke. <laughs> and that's an important thing, just jumping off what you were just saying. What is the basic foundation here? Like, is there some group of people who is magically never going to have heart disease or strokes? And the answer is no, that's all of us are headed down that path until we solve aging. Um, so is cannabis making things worse is a really important question. And that's not really asked um, in a specific study like the ones we're going to talk about. They're looking at a very specific, narrow focus of, of people and questions, and they're not thinking about the big picture. Um, and, you know, stop the presses. We don't know very much about cannabis. We don't know very much about how it affects people. We don't know very much about any of it. And to jump to conclusions, especially dramatic ones, should give people pause. Yes, um, I would completely agree with that. And I think there's a, there's a lot of ties that we can make between the current study that's out and some other kind of topics that are less discussed. Like I, I've talked about cannabis and pregnancy on this podcast and how stress is so bad for a developing fetus and for a mother that's going through that and how that's a risk factor on its own. But then using cannabis can help decrease that you know stress and that that risk and et cetera. But what I'm really focusing on here is these studies are looking at chronic cannabis consumers and these risks of cardiovascular disease 
Do we also think that maybe the chronic cannabis consumers also might have increased stress and anxiety and depression in their lives and maybe they're using cannabis to help with some of these other factors just to improve their quality of life? And I, I feel like these, these studies just don't capture capture humanity well. It's really just crunching numbers that... And we'll wait to talk about the actual numbers until we talk about the studies, which actually maybe now is a good time to start talking about the studies because there's there's a ton of limitations. I will start with the limitation of these have not been peer reviewed. Like these are not in press, these studies. These are going off of abstracts that are to be presented at a, at the American Heart Associ Association scientific sessions, November 11 to 13th. So all of these claims come from like really, really, really limited data that is publicly available to us, even though we have hundreds of headlines saying that you shouldn't use cannabis and it increases risk of cardiovascular disease by 33%. Like we can't even look at the data. I can't believe we're sharing this on media sites right now. It's it's insane to me. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I think I think there are there are th there's so many ways of attacking this. Um, <laughs> but but one thing I think it's really important to bring up right as people are thinking about this is the difference between causation and association. Um, and I want to give, if I, if I may, I want to give a simple analogy for people to understand. Oh, you may, um, please. So if we think about baking cookies as an example of causation, um, imagine that you're baking cookies, you add sugar to the cookie dough. The sugar directly causes the cookies to taste sweet. This is causation. You do something, adding sugar, and it directly causes a result, which is sweetness in the cookies. On the other hand, roosters crowing and the sun rising is an association. You know, think about a rooster crowing at sunrise. The rooster crows every morning as the sun rises without fail. However, the, the rooster's crowing doesn't cause the sun to rise. They're associated because they happen at the same time, but one does not cause the other. Um, so it, it's an important thing to think about because if we if if we say that cannabis is associated with heart disease, you have to look into what other things are related to heart disease. Things like depression, anxiety that that you'd mentioned. Certain medications can cause that. There's there's a whole boatload of things which we know cause heart attacks because we've seen causation studies. We've seen years and years of medical research and then look over to the cannabis world we have this association um, but people aren't thinking that if someone were really anxious if someone were really depressed if someone were not getting the care that they wanted to get not a, not getting ideal care what are those people going to do they're just going to sit around suffering on the couch no they're going to go find ways to feel better and cannabis is the human medication for for twelve thousand years it's not surprising that people will turn to that. And some people turn also to things like smoking and things like alcohol and things like cocaine. And when scientists come around looking at these people who are suffering in one way, self-medicating in another, they're going to surface associations. But what we do as readers, we have to be critical of that. Wait a minute. Is it the heart attack causing the cannabis use? Is it the depression causing the heart attack? There's a lot of different angles, a lot of ways to skin this cat. The limitations of these studies, let's keep talking about those because a lot of this has to do with survey data or just utilizing data that had been in a hospital system for a long time and just kind of like crunching those numbers. No, no, I, I, I agree with you. I worry, Riley, um, I, my experience is, is the general audience gets lost when scientists talk sort of over each other and, and not you and I, but just the literature. And when we dive into data that's beyond the consumer, I think they, th that's, that's not, in my experience, as effective as when we talk about the things that they can grasp. You know, for example, um, understanding cannabis is complicated. Figuring yeah. out how cannabis affects the heart and how, and how it affects the health isn't easy. No. Um, in part because it used to be illegal and it was hard to study. And, and science is just catching up. You know, some yeah. studies say that it could be bad for your heart, of course, causing things like heart attacks and, and strokes. But other studies are saying that it could be beneficial, you know, like lowering heart rates, the stuff we're talking about, rate, you know, lowering blood pressure over time, 
um, and reduce to reduce the risk of stroke and heart attacks. I've had messages from from social media people saying like, my doctor prescribed me cannabis to help with my heart conditions. And I'm like, exactly. And right. what you said in the beginning of like, it's not beneficial for us to look at this complex plant medicine which with such a narrow scope because that's not the way it works. Right. The plant is a biological entity. It has so many different molecules and we are biological entities with so many different receptors and all of us have different experiences and all of us have different relationships with the plant. So, you know, reducing all of this data into a, a one sentence headline is is absurd because it really doesn't capture the human experience with this plant well at all. Right, right. I think behind the buzz, sort of separating fact from fiction, fiction in the reporting is really important that, that news about science gets twisted. You know, sometimes the way news talks about science isn't quite right. Reporters... You know, make things sound simpler than they are to get your attention, um, and that can that can mess up what we think we know about studies. Reporters are usually in a hurry to get to their stories, you know, get their stories published. Um, they might not get all the details, they might not understand them, or they might use some information and not others. You know, one of the things that struck me, they were all referring to this 2020 paper, um, and actually that 2020 paper is remarkably pro-cannabis, and the whole point of that paper is let's study this. This seems to be re related to things that we, we care about and we want to know about. You know, the tables list so many studies that are, that are actually heart healthy. Um, there are a couple small sections that, that raise risk in, in older adults, in younger adults. Um, and, and this sort of salacious CNN reporting just took these tiny parts that are really negative without giving the context. And it's, it's just deceptive. I agree. And just for listeners who are regular cannabis consumers, is there any people that maybe have specific underlying conditions that they should be aware of any cardiovascular risk factors if they are a regular consumer and maybe they already have something going on with their heart? Or is that something that you discuss in your in your book or in your practice? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly something I discuss in the book and my practice. Um, the, the truth is, um, Cannabis is has effects um, that are called um, cardiomyocytomimetic, which means is a fancy word for saying it, it, it attaches to heart muscle tissue and it gets it going. Um, we have a heart rate which is electrically induced. Our brains tell our hearts to beat at a certain rate. And sometimes those are affected by chemistry in the blood. When you get really scared, your heart might beat faster. Um, cannabis as a compound touches the heart and increases the heart rate in the short run. Um, so for people who have heart rate troubles, arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, they should they should seek medical guidance when they're consuming cannabis to understand it. Um, in some cases, cannabinoids can be helpful. In some cases, they can be making the heart beat faster. Um, and you need to know about your heart rate and your sensitivities. You need to know about the cannabis products and what you're taking. Um, and doing that with, without help is sort of sacrificing a really readable, easy, easy, easily achievable opportunity. Um, but you know, we live in we live in times now where people feel pressured to know everything. That because yeah. of the internet and this sort of universal availability of, of knowledge, people feel pressure to, to to handle things themselves. And you know, we wouldn't do that with the plumbing in your house or the electricity. You're not going to go rewire your whole house. Um, why would you do that with your health? with your health. And I think a lot of that might be just trust with your practitioner. Maybe people don't feel comfortable talking to their to their doctor. Like not every doctor is like you mm -hmm. um, and, you know, pro cannabis and, and wants to talk about that. But there are a lot of physicians out there for people. Maybe try switching physicians if you have that resource or doing some sort of online um, help with with physicians if you need that type of guidance on that same topic. Um, have you noticed or seen any data on, because these studies do not address this at all about the actual method of consumption, which is crazy to me that these studies are not saying whether it's inhaled or eaten or whatever it is, but 
Um, again, just for listeners' um, information, have you seen any association with if you're if you're smoking, if you're dabbing, if you're inhaling versus if you're eating and you have that slower onset versus that rapid onset with inhalation? Are there differences there, um, or is there anything notable to talk about with the cardiovascular system? Um, it's a very complicated question. Um, so basically. When you consume something one way or another way, your body changes it so that it can process it and get rid of it and te- keep the things it wants. Um, that's that, that degradation, that change in chemistry, um, is different from one person to another. You know, if, if you think about us as having, like chicken, red meat and white meat, um, we all have different ratios of stuff in our bodies which process cannabis differently. Um, if we say all chicken tastes good, the people who really like dark meat are going to feel like that's not true. And then wait a minute, the people who like white meat, they're gonna say that's not true. So we have to be careful when we make generalities about methods of consumption because the stuff is changing in our bodies and one person might enjoy it and work well while another person doesn't. Um, it's a, it's I, a really, I was kind of talking about like, like like time of onset, like rapid onset of like smoking and vaping, how that might change a person's experience versus like the slow gradual um, of edibles or- No, understood, understood. So so thinking about about method of consumption without thinking about the density of of what is being consumed, um, I mean, that's another layer that's really important. Um, And if, for example, if you, if if we just talk about um, inhaling, you can you can inhale something with a vapor, with vaporized flour, and you'll get very slow um, systemic concentrations. That's different than if you inhaled a vaped concentrate, where you get really high density very quickly. If you weren't used to inhaling something that's very concentrated, that could feel scary. Yeah, so even okay. though it's not about the cannabis, the density that you're inhaling can activate your fight or flight response, and that can increase your heart rate. So it's not just, I mean, it's very hard to tease apart what is just cannabis doing because it's in the whole body. Um, and that's that's the kind of nuance that gets left on the table with reporting like like what we have. You know, we, we need to take a step back and see that science is not looking at a big picture in an individual study. Um, they're looking at a very narrow view based on the, the, the tools that they have available. You know, as you were saying, the survey data, what, what patients are reporting they're doing. So they didn't even know if it's true or not. And they have no idea about the products. They have absolutely no idea if people are, as you're saying, consuming concentrates, if they're dry or vaping, if they're smoking. Like these would be the relevant data that would be maybe more impactful to include in a study like this. What What are your feelings about, this is kind of a side note, what are your feelings about researchers using the word marijuana versus cannabis in peer reviewed literature? It's funny. I, I, I talk about that in my book um, because <laughs> I've gone through a. I've gone through an evolution with that word. You know, I think there's a there's a huge community that is kind of raising tiki torches, saying we have to speak perfectly, we have to we have to know the right language, we can't support racism, um, and they're they're sort of angry and aggressive about it. Um, and I, I understand. I, I'm as a scientist, I think we should use scientific language, yeah. but I also think that we shouldn't turn off a whole group of people in the world because we're being stuck up about our language. Um, the, the the problem isn't the language. The problem is what the language represents. We should the all context, stand up yeah. against racism. Yes. We should all stand up against ignorance. Yeah. Um, but I think we shouldn't get stuck on wording um, because that's not the point. Um, you know, I think if, if we understand that when someone says marijuana or they say cannabis, they mean this plant, we don't need to kind of fight about it. Like we have enough to, to worry about and, and enough hatred in the world. Um, anytime we can get on the same page, you know, better to leave those silly arguments behind. Yeah, okay, I, I have similar feelings and I know there's a lot of communities trying to like take back the word marijuana um, and start to use it as you're saying in a positive context. So it's not this like weird villainized word. I just I was just curious because these studies do refer to it as marijuana and and kind of talking about more of just like language and how these researchers clearly are not intertwined with the cannabis community at all. Um, you know, 
the second study we're looking at that has, you know, 100,000 participants, part of that was also grouping people by if they if they are within the cannabis use disorder group of people, which they say three in 10 people who use cannabis is going to develop cannabis use disorder. So a limitation that they said in their study is that cannabis use disorder is characterized differently by different hospitals. So this was a little tough when you're going into that system. I think that's insane that they say that three out of 10 people are developing this kind of arbitrary disorder just because you're consuming a plant medicine regularly and maybe don't even have any sort of issues with your relationship with the plant. Is cannabis use disorder something that, that you see a lot or in, in the hospital setting? Is that is that a relevant term like ever? Or what are your feelings on that? It's it's a it's a it's a great question. Um, it is it is a completely baloney word. It's a completely yeah. baloney <laughs> disorder. Um, and and one of the things that well let me let me break it down. So so what qualifies as cannabis use disorder? Number one criteria: use of cannabis for at least a one year period. So if you're using cannabis, guess what? That counts. Um, if you if you use the 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 medicine if you use cannabis in larger amounts over time guess what that qualifies and you know what happens when you use cannabis anyway normal use you're going to need more of it over time that's basic human tolerance that right. happens with the morning shower you're going to need to have hotter and hotter water that doesn't mean you have shower use disorder um <laughs> and, and and we could go on and on like this there there are i think nine or ten maybe eleven criteria um that sort of could qualify someone as having cannabis use disorder. Um, it comes from an era where people didn't understand anything about cannabis, how it should be used, how it's problematic, how it's good. They knew nothing. Um, so no, it's a, it's a trash bucket diagnosis and means absolutely nothing to me. Okay. Yeah. I was surprised by that one. I was surprised that all of like all this information in the hospitals that people were actually documenting cannabis use disorder to that degree. I found that a bit strange, um, especially with, as you said, a, a very poor understanding of this arbitrary term that um, seems to be just stigmatizing the population of, of plant medicine users. But anyway, let's uh, let's just continue just talking about these studies because again like do you think there's any reason for our community to be concerned with this data before we even really know anything about this data or are we are we as you said based on the lived experience based on the evidence that we've had from literal generations millennia of users that it's really almost propaganda i would call it at this point yeah yeah it is so so lived experience is a really important word um what does that mean in the scientific context? You know, when when you have uh, political discussions about one party or another and what what the politicians are doing, when you have the peanut gallery yelling their thoughts about it, we call that armchair politics, um, where someone doesn't really get off their behind enough to really kind of either hold a picket a picket sign or get involved in their politics. They're just kind of in the peanut gallery calling out things because they want attention. Do they um, have feelings? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they have feel big feelings. <laughs> big um, feelings. This this reporting is an expression of big feelings. And if you look at the author, you know, if you take a step and really see what's happening, you look at the uh, the journalist who put this the CNN article out. This is not a new direction for her. She's been on this train yelling for many many articles for years. Um, so so that should should give pause to someone who's who's reading this and and sort of look at your sources. Clearly, this person wants you to believe a very certain thing. And guess what? It's exactly what she believes. And if you read the paper or the, the, the article, you're, you're not going to see two sides here that are evenly balanced. You're going to see a journalist who's dragging you to believe what she wants you to believe. Um, there was a time, I don't know if, if viewers necessarily are old enough to remember, but there was a time when reporting meant the reporter would give you two sides of the story and that reporter would trust you with a brain to come to your own conclusions. Yeah, no, I, I never got to experience that life at all. Um, I think the media has been pretty corrupt since uh, I've ever watched it. I don't, I don't watch mainstream media now because I, I, 
I agree that if you watch CNN, if you watch Fox News, like you're being fed something that is opinionated and it's not about what's peer reviewed and what the community thinks and what these experiences over time say. It's about the big feelings of a reporter who wants to put those feelings onto you so that you share with your community and then this propaganda just spreads like wildfire. Right. And and one thing that's really disappointing is this same reporter is actually on payroll as a producer at CNN promoting Sanjay Gupta and his pro-cannabis sort of pieces. So if you think about that, on the one hand, there's attention seeking, which is, oh, it's OK with the famous guy to put a program out there, which is really popular. But when it's convenient, we'll tell a very different story that's exactly the opposite. Um, so it's, it's, it's really important to see that level of, um, I guess we call that bipolar uh, reporting. Bipolar reporting, I like that term. And I don't know if you uh, saw what I put on my Instagram story today, but I was reading the CNN article just to like, essentially just rip it apart and talk about these crazy bias perspectives in there. Um, but they referred to people in the study as abusers and non-users. Like, there's, there's no in between. It's like, if you use cannabis daily, you are an abuser of that plant medicine. And then if you don't use it, you're just, you're just a non-user. I, the, the language that we use is so important in scientific literature and media. And I actually can't believe that they don't have a second set of eyes on these different reports saying like, hey, like maybe we shouldn't sound like we have an agenda here and, and maybe we should sound a little less biased. But instead it just, again, goes out to everyone and everyone's sharing it, even though there's insane misinformation present here. Right. And, and I think, you know, it's important to understand why journalists make these kinds of mistakes. You know, I think it's it's important in my mind for three reasons. Um, simplification and headline appeal. You know, these these journalists want catchy news. They want to have someone see them as a reporter who's worth, you know, worth his or her salt. Um, the second is getting the science wrong. You know, journalists make these mistakes because they simply don't understand the science. They don't know how to put it together. And if you have a one-sided bias, you're not asking the other side for help. And if you notice, this article refers to experts who, by the way, have no clinical experience at all. I noticed that. I noticed that. And they're like, this person was not involved in the study. And they put a huge quote. And I'm like, so why are we including them in this article? Right, right. I and mean, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're really, you know, after one agenda. And the, and the third is, you know, these these articles, as you alluded to, come out very quickly. You know, there's a, a abstract published and this reporter wants to jump on that. And anything which supports that, they get to, to plant a flag saying, oh, they were the first person to say this. But they don't take a step back to understand what they're reporting. Um, and, and in that case, we get into this telephone game. You know, the paper calls news a half-hearted, incomplete read of a review paper from three years ago, which itself was a re review of other papers. Right. So we're talking about sort of third party reading of misread papers by misread people. It's it's really unfortunate. It It is unfortunate. And um, I, this is kind of a little conspiracy theory. -y, but um, what, what are your thoughts on the timing of this coming out? Because normally I would I would think that people would wait till an actual peer reviewed study came out so we could actually look at like the methods and what the authors said the implications and the conclusions are. But as you're saying, and as we've talked about, all we have are abstracts from these two, you know, studies. We we really just have the abstracts for the presentation that's coming up in the future. So we have we have just a couple paragraphs that we're making these huge huge conclusions about. So I've I've seen a lot of people in the cannabis community saying, you know, um, with Ohio voting this week on legalization, which great job Ohio, we passed cannabis, that's awesome. People think it has to do with like them releasing this story to fear monger the people of Ohio. Um, have we ever seen something like this? Oh. Do we think there's any link here or is it the cannabis community just, you know, getting a little conspiracy theory like we always do? That's funny. Um, I, I would not have thought of that as a sort of political move because Ohio is so sort of in the balance for, for politics. No, I think I think the American population has spoken with respect to cannabis. You know, nine out of 10 people think this should be in the hands of everybody, that adults should be treated like adults to make their own decisions. 
um, that nobody really wants the dirty hands of government involved in their personal decisions for their health. Um, so no, I don't. I don't think this is related to that. I think it's just um, a reporter, you know, who can't help herself jumping on a, a time bomb. Um, I think it's just going to be so ugly in the in 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 hindsight. You know, once we once we have um, a clear view of of cannabis, this is just going to look like such a stain on this reporter's sort of record. Um, it's not only irresponsible reporting, it's badly done. It's misunderstanding the literature. It's just a really sloppy, you know, sloppy representation of, of what could have been good quality reporting. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think we saw something similar happen with cannabis and COVID. I don't know if you remember those headlines, mm -hmm. you know, Forbes, CNN, like everyone just saying like cannabis cures COVID. And actually we have more data now that there is a lot of validity to that. But I also just... I always just think it's insane that these media put out these these huge sexy headlines that are supposed to be backed in science, but we always have just, it's just a, a little piece of the puzzle and it never tells the whole story. It's never from hmm. like an actual like user first perspective. So, I mean, that was kind of the opposite of what we see here because that one was very like pro, you know, smoke cannabis and save yourself from COVID. And this one's like, hey, smoke cannabis and you're gonna die or one third of you are gonna die. And I think, you know, it's, it's always about just clickbait and what's sexy, but I'm. it's great to hear your opinion just saying we don't have a lot of validity for what's being claimed in these headlines. And we, we need to, as a community, as a society, stop sharing this stuff. Reach out to CNN, say, hey, this is a really bad article. Um, is there anything else you suggest that we can, like, help uh, bridge this really misinformation gap within the science community and the media because the media is evil in my opinion i don't know what to do about it but <laughs> you know i'll i'll, I'll tell people I, I, it's always hard for me to to sort of come out as a sort of humble brag um but one of the things that i have that's special about me is i see thousands of people who are using cannabis over time and i have gotten to see them some of them growing up over over 10 years and i have inside view of what effects cannabis has and doesn't have. Um, and what makes me different from these reporters in this reporting is they have no idea. They're reading a pile of papers and trying to draw conclusions without grounding it in reality. Um, and if, if they spend time to look at the pile of papers that they're looking at, half of those papers have been paid to show that cannabis was bad. Um, and that is a dangerous thing in science because science is a is a journey, as we started off saying, and it's built on lessons we learned from the past. But when that past is full of poop, <laughs> what we're building on are papers full of poop. And that's really dangerous for us to go forward thinking that that's the right information. So my view is based on the patients I've seen for a long time and I can tell you I've seen some of the dangers of cannabis I've seen people do too much I've seen people have heart issues that does happen but it is very rare and it depends on environment it depends on what they're consuming it depends on their genetics it depends on their 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 nutrition habits their exercise habits you know what cannabis is just like everything else you can do it the right way you can do it the wrong way um, we're not going to see headlines like these with any truth to them. I love the way you just said that. So thank you so much for that. And I think that's gonna bring a lot of peace to people's um, minds after hearing this type of research. I, I really like that you just brought up funding sources of research. You know, that's always something that we need to pay attention to when we see new research coming out because a lot of very wealthy institutions do have an agenda and they wanna get that information out there. and there are biases no matter what in peer-reviewed literature or not because even if the data you know points in one direction or another that data depending on how it's analyzed and who it's analyzed by can tell a completely different story so i would agree like take this information 
with a grain of salt. It does not capture our community well. It does not capture the science well. It essentially only captures the biases of specific reporters very well. Cannabis users, cannabis community members, we know this data is not true. If we saw 33% increase in heart attacks after using cannabis, I think our community would be aware of that. And I think someone like you, especially a physician, a doctor, somebody who meets with patients would be hyper aware of that. And we're not seeing that with anyone who works directly in or with, with the community. Do you think it's worth here talking about at all like uh, carbon monoxide and nitrous oxide, any of these sort of components of, of smoking and, and health? Or what do you think about that? Um, we can certainly talk about nitric oxide. Um, so people probably don't know. Nitric oxide um, is a compound that is made in our bodies to help our blood vessels expand. Um, it happens for lots of different reasons, but suffice it to say, different components of cannabis trigger aspects of nitric oxide production, and some aspects of cannabis inhibit it. They stop nitric oxide from being produced. Um, so newsflash, the type of cannabis you consume will impact the nitric oxide that your body releases. So that means in certain organs or in certain people under certain conditions, you'll have heart issues that are problematic. You'll have also other times and other issue, other circumstances where cannabis is going to help your blood pressure, your heart rate, your, you know, um, your vasculature constricting or, or expanding. Um, so it really does depend on what you're consuming, who you are, you know, the, the details matter. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how to get deeper than that, because we really we really can't. You know, it's, it's so hard to. to make conclusions about. Yeah, it's, it's just hard. It's hard to come to conclusions about how cannabis in general works. I mean, that's like it's like saying if you eat food, you will be healthy. Well, what kind of food? You know, is it Actually, healthy food? Is it junk food? That's like one of the last things I wanted to talk about here is like, let's forget about cannabis for a second. And what are some ways we can just promote good cardiovascular health for people um, just separately? I'm, I immediately think of like diet and exercise. Is there, is there anything else? Is there, is there ways that we as a society can make sure that we are paying attention to our cardiovascular health and doing whatever we can as preventative medicine? Yeah, no, I'm, I, I think people in the culture generally know they should be eating healthy, they should be sleeping well, they should be exercising routinely. Um, but there's also an, an emotional mental health component of our body and our health that people are just starting to get. I mean, I think people feel free to complain about stress or they're, they're complaining that they, they don't have enough sleep. But listen to yourself. If you're feeling challenged by your work or your home life, that stress and those endorphins that come um, those actually cause damage, and we know that those are harmful. So it's really important for people to feel more comfortable, to, to ease their stress, to ease their um, sleep schedules so that they can have restorative sleep. Um, healthy routines that are, that are sort of supporting your mental health, your relationship building, um, those are all really important to physical health too. Um, and that is actually core to the discussion of cannabis and heart health, is that a lot of people who do feel stressed and do turn to cannabis are doing so because it makes them feel better. And that is healthy. You know, even in cer some circumstances where the cannabis chemistry is potentially harmful, there might be a counterbalance of the benefit that those people get by not being stressed or by sleeping better. Sleep is a huge component of cannabis use. I know we, we know it's one of the main reasons why people use cannabis and as you're saying, if, if you're using cannabis and it's lowering your stress and it's helping you sleep and it's getting you towards that healthy point, I also notice, I think munchies get like a bad reputation that people get the munchies and then they devour like Oreos and french fries and stuff. I know that some people, but I know a lot of people who use cannabis and psychedelics when they are under the influence of something, they actually want to eat something healthy. Like they're attracted to fruits and vegetables and these like natural sources of food. I don't know if there's any peer reviewed data on that, but just from a community basic level, like I've seen that trend in my friends and my community. And I think that's another benefit. And the munchies can be a good thing. Just like everything, there's a yin yang to it, right? Like if you, 
if you struggle with feeding yourself and having an appetite, the munchies are a great thing. And then for some people, if you struggle stopping eating, then the munchies might not be a great thing for you. But there's ways to use this complex plant medicine to use different products to get what you want out of that product. Totally. Yeah. And, and spoiler alert, um, I had a discussion last night with Ethan Zahn, the um, the winner of the third season of Survivor, about this very topic, about the munchies oh, cool. and about how <laughs> about how um, munchies actually symbolizes an increase in your metabolism. Um, and it does cannabis does show effects that that lead to an understanding, which is you're efficiently processing sugars better when you're consuming cannabis. And your insulin production goes up when you're consuming certain types of cannabis. Um, I'm going to be spilling those uh, videos over my social feeds in the next couple of days. I caught a little bit of that live. Um, was that last night? That seems like forever ago. Um, I caught a little bit of that. Yeah. I, I loved watching it. I, I really enjoy watching your lives and seeing your content. And I've had uh, I've had other like medical doctors on here who also create content. And I also just want to say this to you that. I appreciate seeing people with your expertise and your knowledge creating content on social media because that's a huge gap in reaching the actual community and consumers of plant medicine is using the methods that they use to get their information, which is social media. So shout out to you. <laughs> no, no, right on. Thank you. I, yeah, no, I, I wrote the book for people who read and I am on socials on all the socials on, on a daily basis trying to educate people exactly like you said where they are. So if somebody wasn't well versed in scientific literature, do you do you have any resources for them to help learn about medical cannabis, about whatever situation that they have going on with their body? Yeah, totally. I mean, one of the things that I've been trying to do is simplify the research so that everybody's on the same page. Um, you know, one of the things I've done is build this the world's largest library of cannabis publications called the Seed Library, CED Library. Um, but that science is really thick and there are doctors and scientists like like you who can sift through that and learn and, and understand it. But it's hard sometimes for people who haven't gone to years and years of schooling. For those people, I built just recently the world's first cannabis librarian, which is an AI chatbot. And you can go to ai.benjaminkaplan.com and you can talk to a chatbot and the chatbot will surface what information you're asking about translate the science so that everybody can understand wow that's incredible i mean not even even if you have like the ability to read scientific literature the time it takes to really dive into all these different studies is insane so i think that's an incredible resource for the community did you deal with any uh censorship dealing with ai and these cannabis chatbots because i've tried to just make like little images on ai and it's always like you can't do that you can't <laughs> you can't show right. it now you no, can't talk about exactly. weed <laughs> Exactly right. And actually, just yesterday, I learned that I'm I was cut off by Venmo. I've been cut off by banks, you know, anything that's related to cannabis. People don't understand how much of a battle it is for people like you and I to make this work. Um, but actually, this this chatbot I built from the ground up. So it's not built on other technology. Oh, um, and I did okay. that so that and it's important to know um, the chatbots that are out there, you know, open AIs, the, the um, Claude, uh, Bard, all of those are built in the current mainstream architecture, which means they're anti-cannabis. And they also 100%. surface data, they also surface data, which is public opinion. Um, and I didn't want that. So this librarian that I built is just cannabis knowledge, peer reviewed, published literature, ingested by this bot. And then the bot translates it so that you can ask questions, either one specific question about a specific paper or across the whole literature. Hey, what is the truth about cannabis and cancer or cannabis and depression or what stages of sleep does cannabis affect? You can find all of those kinds of specific details just in a conversation with this bot. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to have so much fun with this. Um, and that's something that's on your website as well. You said that's available there. Yep. Awesome. It's live right now. Awesome. I can't wait to explore that. While we're on the subject, what are your socials? How do people find you? You mentioned your book is on Amazon. Um, do you take any patients remotely? Um, any other information to help the community? Yeah, thank you. Um, so at Twitter, I'm at Dr. Kaplan, D-R-C-A-P-L-A-N. Um, on Instagram, I'm at 
Dr. Benjamin Kaplan, so Dr. Benjamin Kaplan, Kaplan with a C. Um, when in doubt, um, my website, benjaminkaplan.com, uh, that's C-A-P-L-A-N, um, is the way to get me. Um, I do see patients in Massachusetts as well as across the U.S. and broad, abroad. Um, so yeah, no, if people are interested in one-on-one -on -one consultations, that's always welcome. Um, but I'm also teaching online for free for people that don't want to pay and still want to learn. Um, anything I can do to, to help this information get out there, that's the mission I have. Thank you for dropping all that information and thank you for giving your perspective on these studies. I know it's not, um, it's not always like easy putting your uh, opinions out there about things like this, but it's so important for everyone to hear an MD talk about it. Like I have my PhD, I can look at research and I can find gaps in research, but I'm not dealing with people's health directly and I'm not that that link uh, to their health. So so thank you for taking the time and your expertise, writing the blog articles. I'll link that in the show notes. Awesome, yeah, no, thank you, I appreciate it. I think, you know, we, we all have expertise in different domains and this is a mission of, of humankind. We wanna understand how this plant fits into our health. We want to avoid risks, but we also don't wanna be shying away from something that might be truly remarkable and helpful unnecessarily. So it's important that we all come to this table with whatever our questions are, whatever our expertise is, and come to a conclusion together. Awesome, thanks again for coming on, and uh, we'll see you next week on the Bioactive Podcast.